The U.S. has sent nearly $30 billion worth of aid to Ukraine, with a significant chunk of that being military equipment. The equipment has directly supported the nation's stunning counterattack, with U.S. equipment taking center stage and shaping the battle before it was even launched. Russia is now finding out why the U.S. doesn't have free healthcare. But what equipment has the U.S. sent, and why does it seem like Russia is helpless against it? Javelin A week after Russia's invasion of Ukraine, there was one name the Russian army and the rest of the world had become very familiar with. Javelin. This premier American anti-tank system first entered service in 1996 when it replaced the M47 Dragon and has proven absolutely lethal against Russian armor. This is the weapon US infantry would have used themselves in a war with Russia, and its effectiveness is nothing short of terrifying. The weapon consists of two components, the launch tube assembly and the reusable command launch unit. The clue is the brains of the system and features four times magnification at both day and night with its thermal sight. This system allows US infantry to no longer be reliant on supporting heavy vehicles for target identification, and the clue can be used by itself even when no more missiles are available to provide infantry with a portable and very capable thermal sight. A 12 times magnification narrow field of view option allows gunners to effectively zoom in on a target and properly identify it. When the gunner is ready to fire, he switches to a seeker FOV mode at 9 times magnification. This is effectively now being fed into the missile guidance unit. With target selected, the gunner squeezes a second button and the missile is on its way to deliver 19 pounds of supersonic tandem charge high explosive American Freedom to its target. In order to defeat modern reactive armor, the Javelin missile features two warheads that detonate in rapid succession. The first is a smaller charge, which is meant to blow away explosive reactive armor panels being fired up at the missile in an attempt to disrupt it. The second shaped charge creates a narrow stream of molten metal that penetrates through tank armor to deliver an extremely emotional event to the crew inside. When targeting armored vehicles, the Javelin switches to top attack mode, in which the missile fires straight up into the air and then comes down directly on the tank's thinner top armor. You've probably seen pictures of Russian tanks with what were termed cope cages. These metal cages were being welded onto Russian tanks at the start of the invasion to protect from anti-tank missiles, and in some cases could actually be effective. However, against modern anti-tank weapons, the cages were simply wasted labor, and as St. Javelin took a horrible toll on Russian tanks, the Russian Ministry of Defense quickly sought out a new solution. Nowadays, you're probably not seeing many of these cages on Russian tanks because A, most Russian tanks are now Ukrainian tanks, and B, they didn't work. So why are Javelins so effective against Russian armor? The truth is that modern anti-tank missiles of the quality being supplied to Ukraine are frankly terrifyingly effective. Even Western tanks would be hard put to defend themselves against them, which is why the US is gradually adding the trophy protection system to its own tanks. This anti-anti-tank missile system fires explosive charges at incoming missiles that are more effective at disrupting the weapon than explosive reactive armor panels. However, the real reason why Javelins are pounding Russian armor into scrap metal is that Russia has very poor military doctrine and uses its tanks improperly. Tanks are not meant to operate on their own, but are rather meant to be directly supported by infantry. Supporting infantry forces are responsible for keeping enemy hunter-killer teams at bay. Yet, the Russian military has routinely shown that it does not operate armor and infantry together well at all. Often, Russian armor is simply left to fend for itself with predictable results. Kamikaze Drones Odds are you've now become familiar with the names Phoenix, Ghost, or Switchblade. Russian infantry is not only aware of the names but actively fears them. The Phoenix Ghost drone is a loitering munition developed under the US military's big safari weapons program. This acquisitions program is meant to rapidly deliver new weapons to meet unexpected or evolving threats, allowing the US military to quickly counter enemy capabilities using pre-existing technology rather than going through a whole development and testing cycle of new tech. To date, the US has sent around 700 of these weapons to Ukraine, with a significant impact on the battlefield. The loitering munitions can hover over an area for six hours and conduct surveillance at both night and day thanks to its infrared sensors. Once a target has been detected, the drone kamikazes down onto its head with an explosive finale. The drone is great for taking out entrenched infantry, or even lightly armored vehicles such as trucks. The Switchblade is the name most people are familiar with, and has sort of stolen the Phoenix Ghost's thunder. The weapon was conceived by the US Air Force Special Operations Command as a way of rapidly giving infantry a way to provide their own air support in Afghanistan. Traditional air support may not always be available or take time to respond, plus it can cause serious collateral damage. 
The Switchblade 300, however, can be carried by individual soldiers and used for both reconnaissance and attack, dropping down from above directly on an enemy's head. When the weapon was first sent to Afghanistan, it was on a test case basis and in limited numbers. In 2012, US soldiers received 75 Switchblades to try them out in real-world conditions. The result of that test remains classified, but very shortly afterwards the US Army made a request that the weapon be immediately made available in far greater numbers. Insurgents soon feared it and US soldiers loved it. Soon after its debut in Afghanistan, the Switchblade was tested from the open bay of an Osprey transport successfully tracking and impacting its target. This paved the way for a new development between Switchblade manufacturer Aerovironment and Kratos Defense and Security Solutions for a high-speed, long-range, unmanned combat air vehicle that could act as a mothership to a host of Switchblade drones. The UCV would be designed to rapidly deploy an overwhelming number of Switchblades in order to overcome enemy defenses. The US has provided over a thousand of both the anti-personnel and anti-armor version of the Switchblade drone which Ukraine has used to devastating effectiveness. In response to the overwhelming success of the Switchblade, Russia has announced development of its own loitering munition, the LAOP-500, which it boasts twice as powerful as the Switchblade. Given the fact that Russia is bringing T-62s out of museums to fight in Ukraine, take that boast with a grain of salt. So why can't Russia stop these American drones? The easiest answer is that Russia simply wasn't prepared for modern warfare. Despite its many pre-invasion boasts of being able to take on even the military forces of the US, Russia has proven it simply has no idea how to fight a modern war. It has failed to conduct large-scale combined arms operations and displayed time and again a complete disregard for electronic and signal security. The devastation delivered by Western-provided smart munitions proves that it fundamentally was unprepared for the consequences of a smart battlefield. The hard answer, however, is that nobody is really prepared for the loitering munition threat posed by modern drones. There is simply no way of providing adequate protection to infantry forces from loitering munitions, though the US has been working on the problem for a few years now. Electronic warfare capabilities meant to disrupt drone signals or even shoot them down with electromagnetic pulse weapons are now being seen as integral to the very structure of the traditional American infantry platoon. So, the next time big, tough US infantrymen go to war, expect to see Geek Squad fighting right alongside them, because without electronic warfare support, infantry is too vulnerable in future conflicts. Stinger At the start of the war, Russian air forces operated in large numbers across the country. By now, Russian rotary aviation is conspicuously absent from the front lines. The reason is the US-made FIM-92 Stinger and similar platforms provided by other Western countries. Russian aviation is having traumatic flashbacks to the Afghanistan war, when its helicopters were mauled by US-supplied Stingers. Today the weapon system has been updated, but remains relatively the same as it was when liberating communist aviators from their earthly troubles in 1985. The Stinger is a shoulder-fired man-portable air defense weapon, or MANPAD, that can engage targets up to 3,800 meters away, making it perfect for taking out low-flying aircraft such as helicopters. Its smart seeker head can differentiate between the exhaust plume of an enemy aircraft and its engines, helping it home in for a successful kill. To fire the weapon, a battery coolant unit, or BCU, is inserted into the grip stock. This delivers a supply of high-pressure argon gas, which cryogenically cools the seeker to operating temperature. This causes the seeker to be very sensitive to heat sources, thus allowing it to lock on to enemy vehicles with great precision. Once fired, a small ejection motor pops the missile clear of the operator and to a safe range, where the main rocket motor is activated, sending the missile on its way. The warhead is relatively small, only about 2.26 pounds of HTA-3 explosive, a mix of HMX, TNT, and aluminum powder. However, the weapon is designed to directly impact the vehicle's engines, which can be easily damaged or destroyed even with a small amount of explosives. So why is the Stinger once more violently reuniting Russian aircraft with the ground? Once more it comes down to doctrine. Russian forces are doing a poor job of integrating air power with ground forces, leaving low-flying Russian aircraft at great threat from man-portable weapons. However, the real culprit is Russia's basic lack of precision targeting. Most of its ground attack aircraft lack targeting pods meaning they have to come in low for any attack to have a large degree of precision. This puts them directly under the threat of the Stinger. High Mars We couldn't possibly do an episode on US weapons Russia's having a very bad day with and not mention the vaunted High Mars system. This thing is not very impressive on paper. The high mobility artillery rocket system is at first glance underpowered rocket artillery. Unlike its more capable cousin, the M270 MLRS, the HIMARS system has half the number of munitions available to it. 
six GMLRS rockets. It's basically just a truck with a single pot of missiles on its back, so why in the world has this weapon single-handedly changed the face of the Ukrainian war? In the early 1990s, the US Army was retooling itself from fighting World War III against the Soviet Union and its allies to the expected Bush Wars of the future, which would feature low-intensity conflict. This meant the Army needed to slim down and start providing weapons that were mobile and flexible, something traditional rocket artillery is not. HIMARS was developed to meet the need of a light footprint force such as US paratroopers or a small contingent of overseas troops fighting a conflict requiring precision rather than overwhelming firepower. Mounted on a truck, the system has far greater mobility and speed than any of its tracked cousins. And this was a huge draw for a future low-intensity conflict. However, it was exactly this capability that would make HIMARS so valuable to Ukrainian forces. Faced with overwhelming numbers, Ukraine needed a platform that could rapidly deliver a fire mission and then flee before enemy counter-battery fire or air support could respond. Traditional tube artillery would be based around areas in Ukraine, could enact some form of air defense which protected them, but made them very inflexible weapons. HIMARS, however, could quickly drive to a launch site, pop off its missiles, and drive away in minutes, allowing the weapon system to be anywhere it needed to be with short notice. But it's HIMARS's precision and range that makes it truly deadly. Each of the six GLMRS rockets have a range of 57 miles and are armed with precision warheads. This gives Ukraine the ability to punch behind enemy lines at targets out of range of traditional tube artillery, which has a range of around a dozen or so miles. But it's the precision that really matters, because each rocket can be programmed to hit a specific target or to double up and defeat enemy fortifications, striking exactly at their weakest point. The error radius of HIMARS is classified but believed to be no more than a few meters at most, and is likely far, far less than that given the history of US smart weapons. With just a dozen of these weapons at the start of summer, Ukraine began to batter Russian command posts and logistics nodes, leading to an immediate effect on the battlefield as Russian forces were slowed to a crawl as they contended with the chaos being wreaked behind their lines. Russia quickly moved to neutralize the weapon, dedicating large amounts of air power and special operations forces to locating and destroying these mobile rocket launchers. Within weeks of the deployment of HIMARS to Ukraine, Russia claimed it had destroyed all of them, yet the US confirmed that not a single HIMARS had been lost in combat. Was Russia lying? Normally the answer to that question would be yes, but in this case they actually might have been telling the truth, at least from their own point of view because the weapon is mounted on a generic heavy-duty truck frame. Ukraine created multiple HIMARS decoys using trucks painted green. Other decoys were mere mock-ups made of wood, and it's confirmed that Russia has destroyed at least 10 of these decoys with caliber cruise missiles. Russia took the bait and expended significant effort and resources better used elsewhere to find and destroy these fake HIMARS, leaving the real HIMARS safe from attack. The US quickly agreed to supply Ukraine with more HIMARS, and the nation now has just under two dozen of these platforms with plans for more to be delivered. As of September 8th, Ukraine has struck 400 Russian targets with the weapons, making it the hardest working weapon in the Ukraine war, and one that has forced Russia to radically rethink how it deploys its forces. No longer safe behind the front lines, Russian command and control nodes and logistics hubs have been forced out of HIMARS range, which means the rate of the offensive has slowed to a crawl as units have to wait even longer for resupply. Russia has threatened to retaliate against the United States for further deliveries of the weapon system, but given that it can't handle 16 of these and the US Army is equipped with over 400, it seems Russia's mouth is cashing checks its military can't cash. Now go check out what's wrong with Russia's military, or click this other link instead.